time. Because somehow we've got to learn that it's not the weight that we carry, but how we carry it, right? Because none of us can anticipate the time of disaster. Our lessons, well, to those in health, wealth, and power, the lesson is stay humble, because one day we all shall fall. And to those who are stumbling, be patient, because our time to shine is coming. You know this passage from Ecclesiastes is the same one that includes the urging to eat, drink, and be merry. And this is core Jewish theology. It reminds us that the world is inherently good and we are invited to find joy in its fruits. And this passage also echoes the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus reminds us that the Almighty sends rains on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. This warns against assuming that simply because one is successful now that the divine favors them somehow, it also reminds that we are all in this thing together. All will experience anger and joy, exultation and disappointment. And that the things that we measure as signs of earthly success have no purchase beyond this life. And they are not indicators of some elevated sense of inherent value. And all this teaching they are universalist proof texts. We all share similar fate. These are guidelines for keeping our exaltation, our outrage, and our despair in perspective. You know, the ancient Roman philosopher Seneca, he was a very rich man. He owned beautiful villas and magnificent furniture. But Seneca made a habit of regularly sleeping on the floor of his outhouse, eating only stale bread and drinking lukewarm water. This prepared him in case he were to lose everything he shared, freeing him of the nagging fear of catastrophe. Seneca never worried much about what might happen if a deal went wrong because, at the very worst, he'd be back on the floor next to the dog which was something that he knew he could handle. No, we are all not rich like Seneca, but how do we make ourselves more resilient? And no, I'm not going to be as Pollyanna as to tell you, well, you should have prepared yourself to be resilient before things went haywire, because what if things are already going haywire? We often think of resilience most when we are going through bad times, yes? But as Winston Churchill teaches us, if you're going through hell, just keep going. The only way through is out. So the word resilience comes to us from Latin words that mean to jump back, to rebound. Resilience requires us to be in touch with what matters most, to find a way to preserve what is precious and to suffer what slings and arrows that we may, so we can rise again when the dust clears. We need resilience when we want to proclaim our truth anew the day after the storm passes over. And except perhaps for those suffering oppression or debilitating illness, every day presents a chance to live differently, to bounce back, to see the world differently, to transform ourselves to react to the world in a different way. As Maya Angelou teaches, I can be changed by the world, but I refuse to be reduced by it. It's not the weight you carry, it's how you carry it. Weebles. <laughs> That's what we used to call those dolls from the video on resilience. And weebles carry their weight close to the ground. 
Say it with me if you remember this. Weevils wobble, but they don't fall down. <laughs> oh, that impressed me. <laughs> weevils wobble, but they don't fall down. And we played with weevils and peoples in the dirt pile. The, straight, the shaded stretch between my neighbor's yard and my own. Dougie, Tracy, and I would play there. Weevils and peoples were both plastic toys. Weevils had those round bottoms, impossible to knock down. Peoples had stubby little legs and stubby little and feet. They were impossible to stand up. <laughs> they did a lot of sitting on the dirt pile with us. Or those stubby little legs were perfect for stirring mud pies. <laughs> Dougie and Tracy were older than me, but they didn't have contemporaries on our street, so they would leave the TV blaring in their living room when I knocked and said, Can Dougie and Tracy come out to play? They would leave the blaring TV, and their father passed out on the sofa, and the piles of dirt and dust and debris scattered throughout their home. They would leave a place that when I entered felt strange and alien. There was love there, but there was a whole lot of hurting, a whole lot of broken down. I only spent a little bit of time in their home and they only spent a little bit of time in mine. It wasn't just their home, my home must have felt alien to them. The rules, the structure, the fear of leaving a mess where there was none. We played in the space between, in the dirt pile, the no man's land. If I'm remembering correctly, I liked the peoples more than the weevils. I could move their little independent legs. They could do a split or look like they were running. The weevils just wobbled. And I didn't yet know what it was to carry a weight and how a little wobble might just save you. So I didn't yet know the grit of the weevil. But I do remember when my father taught me how to carry a garden tool. I bet you were wondering why the shovel was here. I remember when my father taught me how to carry a shovel. He taught me that if you were holding onto it on an edge or even on an unsteady place near the center or near the center of gravity, it would be harder to carry. Only when you could find that place of balance, that place that was the center of gravity, would it feel suddenly like it was easier to lift the load. Almost like a lesson in miracles. How if you found that place, that center of gravity, it was almost like an angel hand had joined you and was helping you carry the load. Almost as if a gentle, grace-filled wind had reached up beneath you to prove to you that you weren't ever, you weren't ever carrying it alone. A lesson in miracles, finding that center of gravity, that balance. Maybe this is how we carry ourselves in times of disaster. But how do we lift our spirits, right? And that seems like a thing that's easier to say than to do. Lift your spirits. But Mary Oliver, the poet, says, keep in touch with joy. Remember what you admire. Reacquaint yourself with your passion. So for a moment, let us ponder. What is the one thing you know that can always pull you out of your sadness? The one thing that will make you smile or think of something other than whatever is driving your despair? What is it that when you can spend time with it or to practice it lifts your spirits? Something comes to mind, please share them aloud in this space. What lifts your spirits? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Babies. Yoga. Painting. Lifting the spirits. We all have different ways of doing this. I have an old friend who had a very interesting way of doing this. Willie Wojcik, he taught me a lot about life in general, but about resilience in particular. He is a man that looks like George Harrison from the Beatles, and he can still win any challenge if you try and stump him with the Beatles song. He knows them all and will play them upon request. Willie would lift his spirits when he was broke or even just in sorrow. He would give things away. I always get back tenfold whatever I give, he says. He really, he had a violent upbringing. And he had found escape in his life through humor and music and for a while drugs, but then, then he found Jesus, and Willie is still high on Jesus, and he will tell you so, and he's sober as well these last 37 years. But whenever Willie was broke, he'd give things away. And one day, my phone rings, and... He says, Scotty Dog, well, that was his nickname for me, um, Scotty Dog, I got a car and I got to get rid of it. Come over and take a look at it. Now, Willie always had like three or four cars in his yard in various states of disrepair and reassembly. So I knew Willie's way, so I had a feeling something was up. So I went over to his house and he had a 65 Rambler, <laughs> ugly and rusted. It was probably 1985. And it it was the most valuable thing Willie owned at that moment that he couldn't give away. And so I looked him in the eye, and he knew that look, and he said, Scotty Dog, my wife needs another surgery, and I'm broke. So I'm giving stuff away. I need to kickstart the generosity wheel, as he liked to say. <laughs> Willie's theology taught him that when you give, you receive. And from what I witnessed, it worked. Now, I did not need a project car, but I knew someone who did, so I arranged for my friend Steve to pick up Willie's Rambler. But Willie would not let me leave until he gave me a guitar that he had just put together that morning from old parts. And uh, the next week, Willie called me up, and he had a different tone of voice. Apparently, an anonymous donor had offered to pay for his wife's surgery. This kind of thing happens to him all the time. And Willie is on to something, the source of which I'm unsure. I know he would call it Jesus, me, the law of reciprocity or grace. But his example shows the importance of generosity, of reaching out, of asking for help, and of being willing to receive help. Is that not hard for many of us? Being willing to receive help when it is offered to us. And having a community of friends or a congregation, these are often our best sources of this kind of assistance and resilience. Indeed, it's not the weight you carry, but how you carry it. How you bounce back. So let us always recall and practice those things that bring us back to life. Those things that chase away the despair, at least for a moment. And let us ask, how do we take the stones upon which we stumble and turn them into a beautiful altar? An adult now with two children of her own, Tracy won't let anyone call her Tracy anymore. She is Teresa. And she is warm and ebullient. A few years back, she reunited with my parents and had something to tell my mom. She said, you know, you saved me. I don't know if I would have made it without you. Teresa would talk not often, but at times with my mom, when her mom couldn't listen, when her mom couldn't help her lighten the load. She needed proof. She needed proof that she was not really carrying it all alone. I'm not sure if the originator of the Weebles knew their own genius when they chose that name. Peoples, peoples tend to think of ourselves as independent. And when we do, we are unsteady on our stubby legs and feet. But Weebles, Weebles start with the we. We don't have to carry anything alone. 
Sure, our own experience is unique, but we all wobble. And we all have friends in the dirt pile of life that have lived some of what plagues us. They can steady us when our legs grow weary. Tracy said my mom saved her. I don't know if Tracy and Dougie know that they saved me. Because I was watching them in our dirt pile, watching them with my young eyes and learning their innate resilience, watching how Dougie would withdraw with his Walkman and loud music to be all alone and still, to find a peace. And I was watching how Tracy would cry and then find my mom for reassurance, watching how they would both readily leave the dark of their home to breathe the cool air of the morning, how they would play make-believe to keep me company even when they had aged out of children's games. Play is an incredible act of resilience. They were going through hell and they just kept going. That was resilience. Resilience is made in the crucible. Resilience is learned from experience. We don't know our own strength until we wobble, and resilience is about finding that place of balance, that true center of the weight that we carry. Have you ever been overwhelmed after a long day and come home to scream at the fork that's lodged in the drawer? <laughs> I have. I've screamed at that fork many times. And I've screamed at the news anchor who keeps telling me all the stories that I don't want to hear. And while it might feel freeing to yell out my displeasure, I'm just grasping at the edges, at the final straws. I haven't found the center of gravity yet, the core of my load. And we only find that by wobbling wobbling until we find the center. Willie wobbled by giving and receiving till it all balanced out. I have to pause. What I do is I pause and I ask my burden. I say, I know you're not the fork. I know you're not the fork. So what are you really? And why have you grown so heavy? Are you grief? Are you frustration? Alienation? Are you loss? Are you the weight of my imperfection that I was taught to carry every time I didn't succeed. I had to get to the center of the gravity, the truth, before I feel that amazing lifting sensation, as if an angel hand, a gracious wind, has joined me to help me lift the load. Amen.